Revelation chapter 9, please. And uh, we probably will be done with Revelation 9, I expect, today. And Revelation 10 will take equally as long. Uh, there is a lot, always so much, in the book of Revelation. As I've said before, uh, it, to me, is the index to the rest of the Bible. Uh, what you see happening in Revelation, uh, it being at the back of the book, um, and this is by heavenly design, I have no doubt. The beginning of the world and the beginning of the creation is in the beginning of the Bible. And the end of the world and the end of this world, the first world, the first heaven, the first earth, the ending of that is in the last book of the Bible. And the last book of the Bible begins with a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem, the holy city coming down from heaven, from God. And I, after that, there's no need for a book. Amen? Because it's just eternity. And I can't fathom eternity. I just know it lasts a really, really, really long time. And I'm excited about going there one of these days, and I hope you are too. Uh, not just excited about it, but thankful for it. Thankful, as I said earlier, that we get to go to heaven. And why would anybody turn that down? Well, that's what we are looking at this morning in Revelation 9, 16. Uh, open up your Bible, it's there on the screen. But the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, thousand, that is 200 million. It's a thousand, thousand. And I heard the number of them, and thus I saw the horses in the vision, and so this, I believe, is the army. 200 million of these. I saw the horses in the vision, and them sat on them, having breastplates of fire. So these are spirits, uh, and of jacinth, and of brimstone. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was kind of interesting uh, that uh, Brother Casey yesterday, he brought up the he, he said that we're in the last days. And, uh, and I, I'm sitting behind him there at the piano, and I'm, amen, amen. And he said, uh, he said they're having um, testimonies before Congress. And he said, just everything that's going on right now is, is proof of, of the Bible being right, and Bible prophecy is happening in, in front of our very eyes. And he said they're having uh, testimonies before Congress. Uh, about um, aliens uh, going to uh, come down and take over the earth. And he said, I don't believe that. And I'm sitting right behind him going, well, okay, I'm not going to say anything. He said, I believe they're devils. And I went, okay, that's what I believe, yes. So amen. They are, they're coming. They are coming. Uh, I, I saw some very, very interesting um, photographic evidence this week. It made, it made some news wires from Peru, and it was unbelievable what I saw. But anyway, um, the horses and them sat on them having breastplates of fire. This is literal. And of jacinth and of brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions. So uh, picture... Horses with lion heads. Um, let's see here. The combination of, let's see, there, there was in, in uh, Daniel, I think, Daniel 7. Um, or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just seeing it in the wrong place. But in ancient, um, ancient pictographs, in fact, there's one up here. Just off the Mississippi River, it looks sort of like a, a lion with wings. And um, that's called a griffin. And um, the Bible talks about lions having eagle's wings. And in this case here, you have horses, but they have the heads of lions. You'll often find in the spirit realm a combination of different, uh, different animals and so on. And think of lions. Um, and we were talking about uh, blood, I think on Sunday night, dealing with Babylon and how she drinks the blood of the martyrs and she gets drunk off that. And that's a real thing. Uh, it's called adrenochrome. But um, lions get 
the majority of their water supply that they need for their body from the blood of whatever animal it is that they catch. They literally drink and lap up as much of the blood from their kill as they possibly can. And um, in some cases, if a lion has a good run of catching a lot of prey, uh, he has no need for a, a secondary watering source. He gets his water from drinking blood. And there's a lot biblical that I could go into. I won't, don't have time this morning. Um, and so it says um, in verse 17 again, they were, had the heads of lions and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. And so again, two thirds of the people of the earth watch a third of the people of the earth being destroyed by fire and brimstone. Um, and it says in verse 19, for their powers in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents and had heads and with them they do hurt. Verse 20, and here's where it is right here. Here's where I, I just don't understand. And maybe, maybe that's just the difference in the spirit, I guess the spirit of God being in somebody um, when you understand exactly who you really are and you don't lie about it. And then you understand that God is offering you heaven for free. And um, that was something else Brother Casey brought up yesterday. He, was, uh, he asked somebody how they go to heaven. They said, well, you... Uh, you, you be good to people, you, be, you love your neighbor as yourself, and uh, you be kind to others and your family, and you follow the Ten Commandments. And he asked the people yesterday, how many of you could list for me the Ten Commandments? Most people can't. How can you follow the Ten Commandments if you don't know them? But the truth of it is, no one has kept the Ten Commandments except Christ. No one has. There's none righteous. No, not one. And so, with us being unclean, with us being unrighteous, with us being full of sin, and yet God offers us the opportunity to be saved, He's given us time in our lives to repent of our sins. Some people are saved when they're young. Some people are saved when they're old. We used to have a man, Buster Montgomery, World War II veteran, uh, I just love this man to death. He loved this church and he attended with his wife and he was as, as good a man as anybody I've ever met. He was just a good guy. But he come out of church once, he'd been going here several years, he'd come out of church one Sunday and he said, can you come over to my house? I went over to his house that Saturday and we talked for a while and he said, uh, how is it that I can go to heaven? He'd never been saved, ever. 77 years old, World War II veteran. And um, he lied about his age, joined the army when he was, or joined the Navy when he was 17. And they put him through uh, boot camp. And he said the first job he got was they sent him to Pearl Harbor and put a suit on him. And, and he was digging dead bodies out of ships. 17 years old. Never been off the farm he grew up on. And uh, to have to go through that. But he realized he had never, ever been saved a day in his life. And he wanted to go to heaven. And um, usually people, at the older we get, the less likely it is that we're going to change anything. Isn't that correct? We just don't like change anymore. This man wanted to make a change that he knew would last him forever. And it wasn't just a few years after that that he died of cancer. And uh, I tell you what, that's God working in a man just at the right time. But anyway, right here, read this now, verse 20. The rest of the men, two-thirds of the world population, which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils. And if you worship an idol, you worship a devil. I don't care if that idol is called Mary. That's, you're worshiping a devil. I don't care if that idol is called Jesus. That idol is the idol shepherd. I-D-O-L, shepherd. That's in the book of uh, Zechariah, I think, or Zephaniah. One of, one of the Z's. One of the Z-Z prophets. 
But anyway, they, God talks about the idle shepherd. And here it is. They have, that, they have the shepherd, Jesus Christ, as an idol up on a crucifix or standing over a church or whatever. A big statue of Jesus. Down in Sao Paulo, Brazil, up on top of that big hill they got out there. That big statue of Jesus. There's one down there in uh, Eureka Springs, Arkansas, at the, near the great passion play they have down there. We used to go there uh, on church trips and visit that and go, ooh, ah, boy, that's a neat thing. It never occurred to me. This is an idol. And I, and I now know the family that had that built. They were Roman Catholic. They built that thing so that there would be a big statue of Jesus for everybody to pray to. That's why they built it. These, and what, it, what that is, in reality, is a devil. They, should, they worship devils. And look, it says, he says, idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, and which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. They repented of nothing. After watching a third of the people of the earth. And this, this, now again, this is the sixth trumpet. After the seventh trumpet, God's wrath is going to be poured out on the earth. And I see this in Revelation here, this sixth trumpet sounding, as the last chance for anybody to repent. Don't worry about how this fits in with your chart that you got made up or somebody else made up for you about how Revelation is going to work out. I don't know that those charts are all that accurate. I just know that right here, it is specifically mentioned that Two-thirds of the people of the earth, watch a third of the people of the earth, die by the hands of evil spirits, burnt up with fire and brimstone and smoke, burnt and killed right in front of their eyes. And yet the people of the earth shake their fist at God and say, we're not going to repent. Reminds me that I heard it on the in the... Uh, gas station when I went in this morning to get my soda pop. That song, it came out in the 80s uh, from uh, Twisted Sister. We're not going to take it. It's rebellion. Y'all remember that, don't you? We're not going to take it. No, we ain't going to take it. We're not going to take it anymore. It's a, it's a rebellion song. And I remember the video. It's, it's parental rebellion. And uh, that's what this is here. This is rebellion, pure and simple. We don't care about you, God. You, you don't matter to us. And you did all these. You're the one who had all these people killed. So we're not going to repent to you. And they don't. Now, last uh, week we were looking at, we, I think we was in Psalm 115, talking about how the idols, exactly what uh, John saw here, the idols that they have, they can't see, they can't hear, they can't walk. And Psalm 115 said, they have eyes they cannot see, they have noses they cannot smell, they have ears they cannot hear. So why would you pray to them? Um, he says later, I think it's in Jeremiah, he said, one takes a, a, a tree and cuts it down, takes part of the tree, and cuts it up for firewood and stove wood, and burns it in his stove so he can bake bread out of it. He takes the other part of it and carves him out an idol to it and he said it just doesn't click with him that it was the same what makes this part of the tree special enough to make a god out of it and this part of the tree is is worth nothing but to get thrown into it and the idea was do you see how stupid that is you cut you saw the tree in the woods you know it wasn't a god when you cut it down you cut it down you took part of it and you burn it in your in your uh, fireplace, you burn it in your stove so you could bake your bread and you, you do all these things that you do with wood and then you take it and you carve it out an idol. And now you've got an idol in your house from, from that was made with your hands or somebody you know from a piece of wood that you cut down. How dumb is that? How ignorant is that? It's, it's almost like that's what God is saying. Uh, turn to Exodus 32. This I think this goes with Revelation 9, because God specifically mentioned in Revelation 9 that um, 
they, they repented not of worshiping idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood. So in, here's, here's what God does in Exodus 32. We know that Moses went up to the top of Mount Sinai to receive the, the fiery law, the Bible calls it. And uh, God's own finger carving out the tablets of stone and then writing into that stone with his own hand those ten commandments on there. Not ten, um, not ten suggestions, not uh, ten steps for a happy, successful life, not uh, ten steps uh, to better positive thinking, ten absolutes that cannot be broken. And when Moses comes down from Sinai and um, he sees what the people of Israel have done in his absence, he immediately casts them down to the ground. They were breaking literally probably all of the laws that God had just written with his hand. So in Exodus 32, 1, when the people saw that Moses, Moses was up there 40 days. And this is neat because he went up there and he didn't take a backpack full of food and water. For 40 days, he didn't eat. Didn't have to. I believe God sustained him up there. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up! Make us not a god, gods. And... People, I want you to understand that in the last days, yes, there will be an, an all-encompassing antichrist, but he will be accompanied by the gods. And people are going to worship not just one god. They're going to worship the gods. I think it's interesting that God casts, has, has Michael cast out of heaven a third of the angels, that number is 33% or 33 and a third or 33.333333. And in the Hindu religion, they worship and serve 330 million gods, 33. I brought that up to Pastor Lordson Rock, who will be back with us again, I think in October. I brought that up to him. He said, you know, I never thought about that, but he said, you're right. He said, the gods that the people of India worship in, in Hindu, he said, that's those gods. They worship those devils is what they do. Uh, so when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mountain, people gathered themselves in the air and said unto him, up, make us gods, which shall go before us. Uh, as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. You know, that reminds, that sounds like what Peter says in 2 Peter, that in the last days, men shall say, yeah, where, is the, where is the promise of his coming? Uh, I keep, I, I, guess, I guess I listened pretty well to the sermon yesterday because I keep bringing it up to mind. Brother Randy said that his dad, Brother Gene Casey, who... Uh, built up Second Baptist Church over there, um, that he preached all his life that Jesus was coming soon. And he said, he's dead. But you know what? He's coming soon. He said, now it's sooner than when my dad said it. Sooner now. More, we've got more before us as far as responsibility to preach the gospel and to tell the truth uh, in our lives, in this church, in our ministries, and everything that we do. Uh, but people are, will say, okay, you guys have been talking about how your Jesus is going to come back. Well, let's see, wasn't he supposed to come back at Y2K? Well, that didn't happen. Wasn't he supposed to come back in 1987? Because the guy wrote a book called 87 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 1987. And the follow-up to that book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 1988. 
True story, by the way. Yeah. And uh, I heard Gerald Wolfe, he was with the cathedrals back then, and uh, he was giving his testimony at a concert we went to, and he said, the first thing I thought of is, if Jesus is coming back in 1987, what does this guy need with my $5? Because that's what he charged everybody for the book. <laughs> and I went, amen! <laughs> um, but anyway, so they, uh, they don't know what happened to Moses, and they're not willing to wait. And let me say something to you this morning about the blessing of waiting. When you don't know what to do, don't do it. Don't do nothing. When you're not sure about God's will, some will say, well, maybe God's just act wanting you to take a leap of faith. Maybe God is waiting for you to make the first move. You know, when God led Israel through the wilderness, God never one time sat and waited for Israel to get up and make the first move. In fact, God laid it down in the law and he said, you don't go anywhere. If you see that pillar of cloud or that pillar of fire over the tabernacle in the most holy place, if you see it there, then you stay there. Their sign that they were moving was that God would move the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire over a way maybe on the next hill over or maybe a ways out of the camp. And when everybody got up that morning, they saw that the pillar of cloud had moved. Then they, all, they automatically, they started packing everything up. And when they all got in line, they followed God. I just don't see God telling us, make the first move. In fact, I'll tell you this, the day you got saved, it was God that made the first move, not you. Amen to that. Uh, 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 one of, um, I, and I didn't, I didn't know this, but you remember Earl Wallenbrock, Bubby Wallenbrock? We used to work with him and his dad. He was, um, he is uh, uh, Beulah's uh, grandson-in-law, married his granddaughter. And I worked with him and he was here yesterday. And he told me his testimony. He'd been in, his dad was, a, I think, a deacon up here at a Baptist church up, I won't say where, but anyway. Um, and I knew that Bubby had grew up in church all of his life. And, and he, he told me his testimony yesterday. He, he got married and he was trying to get his wife to go to church with him. She wouldn't go. And he was trying to get her and uh, so on and so on. And, but sh she wasn't saved. And when you're trying to instill Christian habits into someone who is not a Christian that they, they don't they don't work and um, but lo and behold uh, she kept saying I'll I'll do it when I'm ready I'll do it when I'm ready well they were going somewhere in the car and she said pull over he said why she said I'm ready so he pulled the car over and they called a man and he said well come out to the house a man from their church and they went out to the house and uh, it was at that time that Earl realized he wasn't saved either. He grew up in church all of his life. He wasn't saved. And so it was God that made the move in both of their lives. They didn't initiate it. God did. And what does the Bible say? They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. When Jesus left in the, in the cloud, he told the disciples... To wait for the promise of his coming. Stay here in Jerusalem and don't do anything but wait. For what, Jesus? Just wait. And waiting involves trust. Because God said wait. Sometimes it gets to that uncomfortable period where... We're going, what are we waiting on? Just wait. But what's going to happen? I don't understand. Just wait. Do you trust me? Well, yeah. Well, we're fixing to find out. Because what happens is some people get into that uncomfortable time and they say, well, I ain't waiting around for this. I, I, don't, I, I, I got other things to do. And obviously God's not moving and... 
So I, I think we ought to, I think we ought to get us something going in this church. I think we ought to get us a program to, and run a program. There's lots of programs on the internet I see. You know, we can go to Rick Warren and he can tell us what to do and all this stuff. You know what Rick Warren, do you know what Rick Warren said in the book that he designed for churches to follow the, the, the paradigm that he established as far as building your church into a mega church? The Purpose Driven Church book. You know what he said in that book? He said we need to get out of the foolish notion that prayer alone will build a living and thriving church. The man's reprobate. He knows nothing. And so his idea was spend a few thousand dollars and have your people come to one of his seminars and he'll tell you about what you need to do and you'll need and first of all you're going to have to get rid of all this church pew stuff and these stupid hymnals and you're going to have to get rid of all the, the your King James Bible isms and you're going to have to get rid of your worship styles and you're probably going to have to run off some of the old people and you're probably you need to go in debt about 10 million dollars cuz you need a new building cuz that building you you got now looks too much like a church and people don't want to go to a church but they don't mind going to some center or some house or some whatever we're just not going to call it a church or they'll, they and, and people don't want to be a Baptist or they don't want to be this or they don't want to be that and so don't tell him just change everything and then you'll start getting a whole bunch of people in and it's about it's all money driven and it's all um, oh what was the word he used it's it's all pragmatism if it if it doesn't work then you do something to make it work and you just keep doing and doing and doing and doing and doing and what god has taught me and every church is different but some on the outside would look at this church and say well that church just doesn't grow does it now we all know here what god has really done with this church and you want to talk about growth. Huh. It's there. But had I, and I will, I will admit, I tried to initiate different programs to get people in. And God finally made me stop. Mike, just pray. Just pray. And I'll do it. I think he's done a good job. I think he has. So that's the problem with Israel at this time. They want not what happened to Moses. And they're not going to wait another day. Now, how would you how would you feel? If you were waiting, you prayed, God, I need you to move in my life. I need you to do something in my life. God, I need you to do this in my life, or I need this in my family, or I, God, I need this for my wife or my husband. I need this for my children. I need this. God, I need this. And you lay it out before God because the Bible tells you that and the preacher told you that. And, and so you're going to lay this out before the Lord. And God is going to teach you patience. He's going to make you wait. And lo and behold, you get to a point where you say, you know what, I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of it. And so you pull away from God and you walk out. And the day after you walk out, Jesus appears in the air to take those who waited home with him. You walked out one day too soon. And that's... That's Israel right here. And that's what has caused churches to go in error. That's what caused me to make ridiculous mistakes. Dumb, stupid mistakes in the ministry and in everything else in life. Refusing to wait. And yet, God, that's, that's probably one of the greatest virtues that God can instill. In fact, it's one of the spiritual gifts. Long-suffering. 
and uh, all through the Bible. If you, in fact, if you read Psalms and don't read the word wait at least 10 times in there, I'll apologize. Now, I don't know exactly how many times the word wait is in the book of Psalms, but I think it's got to be in there at least more than 10 times. Wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord. And then he'll do it. And then you just get right in behind him. If you look at Revelation, when Jesus comes that, in that final descent from heaven on a white horse, you will notice that he is not having to try to catch up to all of the other saints on white horses who have left before him. He is the one in front and the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. They're behind him because they waited on him first. And when he comes, they'll come. When Jesus appears, we'll leave. Amen? And not a day ahead of time either. So, Aaron, did the bell ring? Not yet. And Aaron said unto them, break off... Um, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of all your sons and your daughters, and bring them unto me. How come the men don't have to give their gold? <laughs> That's what I was asking. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears. Gold, gold, gold. That was their God, remember? They had already worshipped gold. They already worshipped it. So now they're bringing it and they're going to make it. They're going to make a God out of it, which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. I can imagine God hearing that and saying, I'm going to kill every one of them. In fact, he said pretty much that. And Moses, acting the part of Jesus Christ, mediated peace on our behalf amen moses said god don't kill him if anything blot my name out of thy book now i love people and i would be willing to die for a lot of people in this world but i would not be willing to go to hell for eternity for anybody. Now, there's, there's, no, there's no hatred in that. There's just, I'm not going to hell. I love people. And I would die for a lot of people. But I would not go to hell for them. And Moses just said, God, take my name out of your book. In that, he's acting the type of Christ who came and he bore our reproach. He bore our sins. He bore our curse. He bore uh, and took away our wrath, God's wrath on us by putting it on himself. And Moses is acting that part out. But now, in, in verse 19, this is what he made them do. When I'm skipping ahead a little bit. It came to pass as soon as he came nigh unto the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. Moses' anger waxed hot and he cast the tables out of his hands and brake them beneath the mount. He took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. They had to eat their God. By the way, that's called transubstantiation transforming the very substance of one thing into another. That's what um, alchemy is about. If you remember learning anything about alchemy, maybe from school or something like that or something you heard or read, a lot of chemistry, a lot of modern chemistry stems from the ancient alchemists who uh, said that they were looking for a way to transform lead into gold. Okay, turn lead into gold. But you really can't do that. The secret was that they were actually trying to learn a way to transform humans, mortals, to immortals. Transform humans 
to gods. And isn't that what Satan promised Eve in the Garden of Eden? If you eat this fruit, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods. So that's what alchemy was all about. It was about trans, tr transforming the substance of who we are as people who are bound to die into people who do not die. And so here, uh, they based Moses as a curse to them, made them eat their God. Their God was gold. And without being uh, uncouth or vulgar, what, happened, what became of all that gold a few days later? Dung. It became dung. There's a lot in the Bible about that. Uh, this is interesting to me. Gold. The weight of gold. And I, there's no, listen, there's no accidents in the Bible. This is here for a reason. The weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and 6. That is the exact same wording that's in Revelation 13, 18. Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast for is the number of man. And his number is 603 score and 6. It's the same wording of it. Not 660 and 6, but 603 score and 6 talents of gold. There's something about gold that is connected with the Antichrist in some way. And here we have this, oh, and by the way, uh, gold, gold here, I'm trying to move ahead because the bell's going to ring. Gold in Ezekiel 28 is part of what Lucifer was made of in his spirit body in heaven. And then the, uh, uh, oh, by the way, he had musical instruments built into his body. This is um, Justin Bieber at a concert. Who's he coming down as? He's Lucifer. That's who he is in this imagery here. He's, his wings are made up of musical instruments. And he claims to be a Christian. Kind of. Uh, in, in Daniel, the part of the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream, the image head was of fine gold. In Daniel chapter 5, they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver and brass, iron, wood and stone. Just like in Revelation 9, what we just read is they worship gods of gold, gods of silver, gods of brass, iron, wood and stone. Six things. Uh, I don't have in here in uh, Daniel chapter 3, the image that Nebuchadnezzar made was 60 cubits high, 6 cubits wide. 60 and 6. Again, you have that number 6 over and over and over again. So there's something related to gold. And probably Revelation 9, they worship gods of gold and so on. And God said, okay, if this is what you're going to worship, this is how it's going to be. This is what you're going to get. Uh, let's go to prayer. Father in heaven, we ask your blessings now upon your word. We thank you, God, Lord. There's, so many, there's more questions, Lord, that I have that I don't have answered. And Father, Lord, in time, I ask God that you would fill my mind and my heart and my spirit with answers from the word of God. Truly, Lord, I seek you out for things that I know not. And I pray, God, that you would show me uh, awesome things, Lord, out of your word. And show us, Lord, all of us, Lord, the, the beauty and wonder of your word. We ask your blessings on it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.